Hi friends, now we have initiated a series on DAMS YouTube channel called as Unplugged where we discuss a clinical case in an integrated fashion and we try to put the lab findings, radiological findings and clinical findings in one place and we try to interpret and see how things are going in a patient. And I want you to know that this is the new pattern of questions that is actually followed in our NEET exam, AIMS exam and even in exams like USMLE which are more clinical vignette based questions. And today, in, uh, today, me and Dr. Rahul Nikumbe, we are, he is a physician and I am a radiologist, together we are going to discuss a case which is relatively uncommon. And uh, you know, sometimes as a you know, physician, you may not think of it as a top differential. So that is the message that we want to create through this video. So uh, I will request Dr. Rahul to take us uh, through the clinical details of this patient. Okay. This is the case. A 26-year-old female brought by relatives in emergency department with complaints of fever, headache and decreased level of consciousness since last 3 to 4 days. She also had complaints of dry cough, dyspnea, intermittent low-grade fever, fatigue since last 3 to 4 days. Now in this scenario, we are getting a case which is having fever, headache and decreased level of consciousness which is suggesting that the patient is suffering from some brain or some meningitis like disorder. And uh, this fever, headache and neck stiffness, all of you know that it is a classic triad of meningitis. Plus, patient is having some features of respiratory system, dry cough, dyspnea. Uh, now, <coughs> now the, on inquiry, she also gives past history of deviation of angle of mouth on the right side, drooling of saliva from left corner of the mouth and difficulty in closing left eyelid which recovered completely after treatment around 6 months back. Now this history of deviation of angle of mouth, drooling of saliva is suggestive of lower motor neuron type paralysis of the 7th now and it is the history which is past 6 months back. Still we don't know is it associated with the meningitis or not, is it significant or not. Now, on physical, on physical examination, we got neck stiffness, decreased level of consciousness, pulse 50 per minute, that is bradycardia and blood pressure is 160 by 90 mm of mercury. Now, this pulse bradycardia with hypertension is nothing but the Cushing reflex which is seen in the increased intracranial hypertension. So, it is a case of meningitis. Now we have to see what is the cause of this meningitis. Now the common causes are bacterial, fungal, viral and tubercular. And this patient is, is also gave us a history that she had suffered from a respiratory tract infection. So most probably it, it looks like a tuberculous infection. Now, uh, so, so far you know we have a history where we have a patient with a neurological disease with meningeal signs and uh, Cushing's reflex mm -hmm. in, uh, indicating raised ICT and we also have uh, a past history of facial neuropathy. Facial neuropathy. And uh, this is the picture that mm -hmm. we have and this patient was uh, sent to us for a MRI. So in front of you now you see a contrast enhanced MRI image. The top image which is, is the axial section and the bottom image is the coronal section. And the striking feature that we see in this MR is this is all leptomeningeal enhancement. So you can see there is leptomeningeal enhancement along the circle of villus, along the basal cisterns and you can see even this enhancement is also seen like nodular lesions in the parenchyma. So sometimes what happens is that leptomeningeal enhancement in some diseases it spreads along the perivascular area on around the perivascular spaces and that kind of looks like a parenchymal involvement as well. So, we are looking at an MRI which is corroborative of mm. leptomeningeal involvement here in this uh, patient so far. So, uh, this is what you know at the most we can add from the MRI here that we are dealing with some meningeal involvement here and that is what we have and we send the patient back to the neurologist mm. for further opinion. Now, the blood investigation of the patient for hemoglobin is 10 that is patient is having anemia Count is normal, creatinine, sodium, potassium, these electrolytes are normal. But the calcium level are 14.2 which are increased, ESR is increased 60, then S, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme level is increased 80, mic 80 microliter and random blood sugar 110 milligram per dl. And this is a case of meningitis. So 
we we uh, we have done the CSA analysis. In CSA analysis, we got WBC count 90 cells that is increase. Then differential leukocyte count or lymphocyte predominant, which are which uh, and protein is 70. All these above three findings of WBC count, differential lymphocyte count, and protein are a suggestive of tuberculosis. But the sugar level is 60. This is not satisfying the criteria for tuberculous meningitis. The sugar is 60 which is increase, just slightly increase than the normal or in the higher normal range. And what will be the cause of this uh, higher normal range sugar? So we check the random blood sugar, it is also normal, patient is non-diabetic. So it is not matching with the tuberculous meningitis. And also increase ACA level in the blood and increase ESR level and increase serum calcium it is also not matching with the tuberculous meningitis. So we are having doubt is this patient having tuberculosis or other disorder. Now uh, you know with this pointers that we have in place and uh, you know some of you might be actually making a differential diagnosis only on the basis of what we are looking at but uh, a chest x-ray would come handy at mm -hmm. this place. So mm -hmm. when we look at the chest x-ray of this patient uh, there is a very striking finding here. So I want you to look at the x-ray here you can see bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy and key thing is it's symmetric. So there is bilateral symmetric hilar lymphadenopathy in this x-ray. So usually you know hilar lymphadenopathy is a feature of tubercular infection as well but in TB it is usually unilateral even if bilateral it is usually asymmetric. Now we are looking at bilaterally symmetric hilar lymphadenopathy and when we now try to add things together we are you know on this x-ray I would say we are probably looking at sarcoidosis yes. and we can actually look do another radioisotope scan called as gallium so uh, sarcoid tissue is known to take up gallium 67 so when we take gallium 67 scan in a patient like this you can see there is high uptake in the lacrimal gland and the parotid gland there is physiological uptake in the nasopharynx giving rise to the panda sign and there is also high uptake in the uh, mediastinal lymph nodes giving rise to the lambda sign so this gallium scan adds to the corroborates to the diagnosis of sarcoidosis in this patient and when I look back at the MRI now with the new found informations that when I saw the MRI at the first go I thought this is a uh, meningeal disease it could be meningitis and yes. I was happy with you know the clinical impression of tubercular I said okay maybe it's tubercular but when I look back at the chest x-ray and the gallium scan finding and add them I think could this be neurosarcoidosis and then I am thinking that what happens to MRI on a sarcoidosis patient. So MRI in a sarcoidosis patient can, uh, although we would prefer to do a contrast enhanced MRI like we have done here, CT would be relatively insensitive here and that contrast MRI will show either a pachymeningeal involvement or a leptomeningeal involvement like you see in this patient. You may have, uh, you know, leptomeningeal involvement extending along the perivascular spaces giving rise to a parenchymal lesion like thing or you may have true parenchymal nodular lesions as well in this disease. Mm -hmm. You may have, uh, you know, involvement of the hypothalamic axis or the pituitary also here and optic nerve uh, mm -hmm. involvement can also be sometimes seen. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, they have t told us a history of facial nerve involvement in yes. the past, but MRI is usually normal. We are not able to pick up that M uh, facial mm -hmm. nerve involvement on MRI. Now, on the basis of what we have seen, I'll, I'll hand over back to Rahul to, you know, actually uh, join the dots for mm -hmm. us. Now, now see the clinical feature first, the clinical features of meningitis with respiratory tract infection with past history of facial nerve palsy. Now the seventh nerve is the most common cranial nerve which is affected in sarcoidosis. Sarcoidosis can affect any part of the nervous system, central nervous system as well as peripheral nervous system. In cranial nerves, seventh nerve involvement is most common and most oftenly it resolves completely. So in this patient, seventh nerve paralysis resolved completely. The other nerves are optic nerve, trigeminal nerve are there. Peripheral nerves also get involved. Now, now then X-ray is showing lymph lymphadenopathy. Now the next what we can do, the next investigation we will do a bronchoalveolar lavage, in which we found there is predominant lymphocytes and CD4 to CD8 ratio is four. The characteristic of sarcoidosis is that CD4 to CD8 ratio is more than 3.5. This is the characteristic of sarcoidosis. Now we have done the biopsy of that lymph node which uh, we got on the chest x-ray and this, uh, this biopsy 
uh, report showed non casating granuloma and which is nothing but the sarcoidosis so sarcoidosis is multi system chronic inflammation characterized by non casating granuloma in tuberculosis we usually get this caseation in in sarcoidosis this is non casating granuloma now on biopsy we have confirmed our diagnosis now it is a case of neurosarcoidosis so rahul what about the treatment here what hmm. are the treatment options now first this is the protocol of treatment F if the diagnosis is confirmed on the biopsy that is biopsy is showing the granuloma and there is no alternative cause then yes it is a case of sarcoidosis start the treatment now if you are in a dilemma is it is a sarcoidosis or you are in a doubt then uh, see these points we will see the clinical features which are consistent with the uh, sarcoidosis first we will see chest x ray then involvement of the other organs like skin uveitis uh, then optic neuritis hypercalciuria hypercalcemia and sevadhana paralysis in our patient we got the chest x ray finding we got the sevadhana palsy then if possible you know, hypercalcemia was there hypercalcemia so was there they, they also helped us uh, to yes then if possible to the biopsy of the aff affected organ we can do biopsy from the skin lesion also and after biopsy if bi a biopsy suggests you of non creating granuloma then diagnosis is confirmed it is a case of sarcoidosis if biopsy is negative or there is no evidence in biopsy then think of alternative diagnosis but there is you are not getting any alternative diagnosis then uh, then uh, then match your finding with the with the blood blood investigation and bronco alveolar lavage in blood investigation you will get increase angiotensin converting enzyme level then bile lymphocytes will be increase increase cd4 to cd8 ratio and panda or lambda sign on gallium scan and we saw e all, all of this in this patient yes then nice. if you are getting this finding yes your diagnosis is confirmed and it is a case of neurosarcoidosis or sarcoidosis okay rahul does the treatment vary if the mm. patient is acute onset mm. or chronic onset yes now if the patient is having acute disease then first is the symptoms if patient is having minimal symptoms then see is the other systems are involved like neurology cardiac ocular if other systems are involved and consider the systemic therapy if the symptoms are minimal and no other systems are not involved then no therapy observe the patient if there is a single organ disease they like only involvement of eye or only skin and and these sites are topically uh, reachable, reachable then you can use the uh, topical steroids no you no need of systemic therapy if the patient is having symptomatic multiple organ involvement then you have to use the glucocorticoids and try to taper the steroids less than less than 10 mg in less than 6 months and use this prednisone in lowest possible dose you know <coughs> if no. this disease is controlled at less than 10 mg then continue this drug if it is not controlled then consider the other drugs like methotrexate hydroxychloroquine and azathioprine and in case of chronic disease the patient is already on the steroid glucocorticoids if glucocorticoids are well tolerated then maintain the dose at less than 10 mg per day and continue the therapy if glucocorticoids are not tolerated then see for alternative diag alternative agents that are methotrexate hydroxychloroquine azathioprine leflunomide mycophenolate and minocycline if glucocorticoids are not effective then directly use the alternative agent and if the alternative agent is effective then taper off the steroids if alternative agent is not effective and then use multiple agents like infliximab cyclophosphamide and thalidomide now we have actually tried to use a, a you know a relatively uncommon mm. thing that you know undergraduate would encounter but we wanted to bring a message to you that sarcoidosis is a multi system disorder and although we mm. typically yes. you mm. all associate in a mm. multiple choice yes. question we look for bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy yes. or like that but you know sometimes patients may come with a neurological mm. manifestation mm. and the key take home message is that you know we saw in this uh, you know discussion was that facial palsy mm. was a very 
important pointer in the patient's history. ACE level were very important. Hypercalcemia was very important. Bronchoalveolar lavage, presence of non-caseating granuloma on biopsy was very important. The brain finding, MRI finding showing leptomeningeal enhancement was very important. And chest X-ray and gallium scan are important. I would like to add here is that although gallium scan is very important in the pulmonary and the parotid and the lacrimal gland involvement, but if we had seen the you know gallium scan in the brain. It is not as sensitive for sarcoidosis in neurosarcoidosis in the brain. Mm -hmm. Gallium scan is not as sensitive. So I wanted to point this out to the residents listening to us today. Mm -hmm. And we have also, you know, discussed at length that what are the possible treatment yes. methods and when to use steroids and when to use alternate mm -hmm. therapy. Mm -hmm. I hope you enjoy this episode of, of Unplugged. Do follow us on Dam's Daily channel on YouTube and on Facebook for more such videos. Thank you.